because of my strange accent, I thought that I will add a few uh, written uh, slides so you can see what I'm going to say about. So prehistoric uh, people moved. As they moved, they made the same stone tools wherever they were. Stone tools are basically the ones you use for kitchen equipment, cutting, butchering, and so on, carpentry, whittling, making wooden tools, and so on, and some personal gear. So the way you do your stone tools is the same like language. From early age, you learn how to do it, and you keep the tradition. And I would like to point out that some of this tradition in the last 400,000 years, if not more, lasted for a very long time, and we have for this the archaeological evidence because 80 to 40,000 years is not something from short from the moment of the Industrial Revolution to the, to, to the iPhone age or to the smartphones. It's much longer, and it, it takes a long time, and people keep their uh, traditions. And therefore, what we are going to look now is see how it works across Eurasia and how because of this, because of these traditions, because they were kept, we can follow and trace the people. Stone tools don't change because climate change. Climate change causes extinction of people. And climate change doesn't cause necessarily any evidence for change in stone tools. The same is the environment. It doesn't matter what environment you are, you still need your kitchen, carpentry, carpentry and personal gear. So forget about environment and forget about climate change. So here. <laughs> Good. So <laughs> here is one example. Uh, bec because I know Manisi pretty well, it was supposed to be the, or the original conquest or this, uh, of colonization of Eurasia used to be considered as the beginning of the Achillean culture. Nonsense. Dmanisi showed it, and I will not argue about the exact dates of this place, whether it is 1.78 or 1.77 or 1. And, and, and just remind you, the stone tools were the simplest core and flake industries. Nothing sophisticated, and core and flake industries are the same equipment for which, within a short time, other people arrived in other places, sorry. In, in, so if you go from Dmanisi, where you see reed fairing digging, where they found the origin of uh, the original layers where the skulls are, and, and the, the, the piece on the left side shows you where they are, we have come to the Achillean. It's a different period, but remember, the first Chinese, the first people in China, got with the same kind of corn flake industries. But there is no time to elaborate. Here we come to another problem, which is with the Achillean. So the Achillean is pretty well known from Africa. It's known from Western Europe, from Western Asia, and from India. It's not the Achillean, the early Achillean for sure, and the middle Achillean not known from Eastern Europe. Why? Can you explain it? Maybe the people there didn't read the book and they didn't know <laughs> that after core and flake industries, it's time to use some bifacial flaking. And bifacial flaking is done in China, and you can follow this in a paper we published in Annual Review of Anthropology this last year. So I'm not going to talk too much about it, just show you how the Achillean is getting out of Africa and Ubedia in the Jordan Valley, where I spent probably 15 years, is a one good indication how you find in the different layers the same kind of stone tools. You have on the left side uh, some bifaces and trihedrals and peaks. You have in the middle a double uh, hendex because they didn't know hendex and normal hendex should have only one point, but it happens in history. And then you have the chopper and the spheroids. This is what you find in Obadiah in every layer over a thickness of over 50 to 60 meters deep. And the, the next is the famous cleavers. And the famous cleavers are well known uh, basically from, from the Achillean of India. And India has plenty of these cleavers. And now they are finally dated to 1.5 million years ago. So we have a way of tying together both the out of Africa of the Achillean with the making of the cleavers in India. Good. So back to Israel for a minute. And what you see, we are dealing with the site of Gesher Blot Yaakov that perfectly dates to about 800,000 years ago. And as you see in the drawings, you have cleavers and handaxes. So the question is very simple. Is in, in Gesher Blot Yaakov, where you have the elephant uh, skull and you see the, the earliest fireplaces in more than one layer identified in the site, 
Did the cleavers came from Africa, the making of the cleavers, as it is suggested on the map, or it is a reverse migration of cleaver makers from India back to the African direction, but just stopping in the Holy Land. So, a question to think about. <laughs> now, modern humans, this is basically an evolutionary story of two parts. The fourth migration, in my counts, is modern humans according to the molecular and nuclear uh, genetic evidence on which you already heard a lot is somewhere 250, 200,000 years ago, including Homo kibish to Skullcraft and so on. And they could have emerged earlier, as you, show, as you saw already from the, the lecture of Ellison Brooks, and de definitely many of the African inventions that Ellison showed us very clearly, and also uh, Lynn Wadley in her lecture, already arrived. So the guys are arriving, colonizing Eurasia, in the same way that the early settlers of North America from Western Europe arrived with all these inventions were already made in Europe and they bring them to this continent and of course immediately they have an advantage over the local people. So no surprisingly the story will be continued. Okay, so the people, the, the modern humans coming out of Africa and in a way like you heard from the lecture of Chris Springer, you have, uh, uh, and from Ellison, we have the, the Mousterian Industries in Mount Carmel. What you should remember is that within an area of no more than 2,000 uh, square kilometers in the Galilee and Mount Carmel in Israel, which is probably no more than 1,000 or less than 1,000 square miles, you have many caves with a good number of fossils. So the more you dig, the more you find. And in Taboon Cave, which has the, the, one of the longest sequences as a cave in, in the world, it's about 23 meters deep, and I'm not going to mention the bottom. At the top you have, in layer B, the Neanderthals, dated to 80 to 45,000 years. In layer C, the modern humans, there are no dates from this place uh, that are good ones, but we, ha we have plenty of dates from, from Kafze and other, and, and other places. And then before it, we have the Middle Paleolithic, the Mousterian, and we have no fossils. So, you can imagine that they were made by some kind of modern humans coming out of Africa. And this is the earliest one, is coming with this kind of uh, Levalois but blady industry. And again, this is the kind of industry you learn from your, ki from your childhood how to make. And these people who make these points go further away. So we see them in Mount Carmel. In the center, you see them in Uzbekistan. And intentionally, I jumped over a site I know pretty well from the Republic of Georgia, from the Caucasus. How far these people got into Central Asia, we don't know. We always assume that people were very successful and we never talk about extinction. And we also don't, when they colonized an area where people were already there, it's nice to talk interbreeding because this makes, make love no war. But sometimes you make war no love and you kill the locals. And this is one of the kind of, uh, relationship well known for between the groups of hunters and gatherers. Okay, so we go on. And these modern humans uh, in, in, uh, in uh, Mount Carmel, you have in school, you have the beads, you have the burials, the organized burials and so on. And you have the same in, in Kafze Cave, which you can see here with the several of these uh, 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 copies from uh, the different burials. And you have the combination sometimes. But then comes the story of the Neanderthals. And if you look at the different populations, because Eurasia is one continent. You can walk, it takes a little time. Maybe riding bikes, it's easier. You can walk from west all the way to the east. So the Neanderthals were not these simple idiots who, who were able to make Levalois points. Everyone who can make a Levalois point is an intelligent guy, well-trained. And if you don't believe me, call my former student, Metin Aaron in UK, and he will tell you that it takes more than a year to do real Levalois in, uh, industry by practicing it every, every day for six hours. Something that only a graduate student can do, of course. <laughs> so, so if we follow these industries and the fossils and the ancient DNA, they already arrived in the Altai Mountains around 70,000. And there is more than one, according to the artifacts, more than one group of uh, Neanderthals. Did they escape from the penetration of uh, modern humans? Or was it before these real modern humans came into the area? You can see on the map that they arrived in Iran, 
We have them in the Hormuz Straits, possibly also all the way to Rajasthan. And if you ask me, they even managed to get from uh, knowing the Chinese material all the way to this place, northern Jilin province, which is next to North Korea. So let the Chinese dig more, and we will have Neanderthals in China, not only modern humans, pr prior to the arrival of modern humans. OK. One of the well-known Neanderthals by now is the Kebara Cave. You can see the skeleton, the burial, and I will not uh, uh, go into the details. And then we come to the new migration of modern humans. And this is, again, not as just a sweeping story going through uh, Eurasia, but it is a very complicated st uh, story itself. Why? Because we relate the production of blade industries, which are much simpler and more like cottage industry when it comes to making stone tools, when you compare it to the Levalois, which you have to be an intelligent to do it. So no surprisingly, plastic industry came after uh, some other things that we did before. And what you can see here is that the blade industry go all the way to Altai Mountains. The blade industry go all the way to, to northern China, where you find industries of real upper paleolithic that if you take them from there, and I've seen them in my own eyes, and break them to either West Asia or even Europe, no one will tell you will be able to say that they are Chinese. So modern humans manage to get there. However, the line that separates these blade industries and the current flake industries, which are part of East and South China, remains the same. There are claims for blade industries in India that goes back to 45,000. I think they are in press. Don't believe everything you read. So <laughs> in addition, the colonization of Australia did not take place straight from Africa. It was by, by industries or flake industries. I've seen it on my own eyes on Silk Road, a very good material, as it was shown before here, to, to make blades. These people were not blade makers. They were making a different current flake industry, much more like Southeast Asia and South, and South China. So they are probably the descendants of some complicated migration of modern humans into northern China and then into the south. OK. Now, to, to, to start the story again from the archaeology, we go back to Egypt, where the, the site of Taramsa show clearly the industry, which is known as the Nubian Mysterian, making a way for the blade in the early blade industries in the Levant, whether it is Xarakil, Boker Tachtit, or the Emir and makes no difference. I think this, I suggested this in 2000. Now, more of the local guys who work there accept it. Around 45, 50,000 years ago, they moved into the Levant, only later to the Caucasus, straight into Europe, all across Europe. And because they came as different groups, ident uh, uh, their identity was not the same. It's not like a mass migration, but a migration of different groups going all the way into Western Europe, not reaching everywhere. OK. And you can see some examples. The Bohunitian in the Czech Republic, which we published long ago with Jerzy Svoboda, and the material from Krakow, or the material from the Ulutsian, and so on. So there are different groups. And the work of Shara Bailey and Jean-Jacques Hublin clearly demonstrated that the teeth of these modern humans differ from one place to another, when you com especially when you compare them to the Neanderthal teeth, which are much more keeping their unique character. So once we are dealing with different groups of people, they penetrate into the region. And what they do, they cause the, the retreat of the Neanderthals, because they take the better areas, probably by using better hunting tools like uh, uh, bows and arrows and so on, all the inventions that came from, from Africa, the Neanderthals retreat to the north, and they retreat to the south. And then uh, through different processes, including decrease in, fer in total fertility rate, etc., without going into the details, they slowly, slowly disappear. And the beginning of the Upper Paleolithic, and I will not go here in, de in details because it's still a controversial issue, the first culture of modern humans was the Chatel Peronian. It's not, in my humble view, not an acculturation of the Neanderthals. And the, the one that everyone accepts is the, the Orinasian. And you can see the Orinasian uh, uh, evidence on, on, on this uh, slide in front of you. And the Orinasian culture is a Western European. And they are, in a way, like the Americans. It's a, it's a, it's a group that was mixed from different groups, became very strong, well united, 
uh, well equipped and what happens to them? They keep expanding like all the others because expansion is in our genes and each of us would like to have larger territory, better territory and better life conditions. And these are the principles I think of human history. Okay, then we, the upper paleolithic people, these modern humans getting also to the Altai mountains and what we see, we see in the Nisova the nice uh, body decorations and I will not show you any of the uh, artifacts and so on. And in addition, the distribution of the blade industries go, as I mentioned briefly, all the way almost to Korea and probably into Northern Korea later, but we don't have enough evidence. Uh, as I have seen uh, men mentioned from the Jilin uh, uh, province and Still, the area that is controlled by current flake industries remain the same. And some of these modern humans who are also makers of current flake industries, but a dif a some, somewhat different from the er lower paleolithic or the mill paleolithic of China, these are the people who invade into Australia. And it's not surprising because Australia, according to work of Birzel, many years ago, Australia was colonized much more than one wave. And one of those waves in, during the Holocene, brought the blade making into the Australian world. People like to expand. You cannot stop them. And this is what happened to modern humans. So now we go to China when really modern humans reach the place. Once they reach the place, you have the modern human skulls from Upper Cave Zukotien. You have the, 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 combina the, the blade body decorations found in Upper Cave Zukotien and some of the bone tools that found in another cave, Xiaogushan in Northern China. So people in the north are there as well. And this was nicely supported now by new, by new genetic studies of the remains from Kenyuan Cave, ancient DNA. The bones were dated already in the past to 40,000. And you can see this publication from the PNAS. Final conclusions for May 2013, because we can change our conclusion anytime like we like. <laughs> The more we learn, the more we know, the more we redesign our conclusions. So what we have is the dispersal roots of modern humans can be traced archaeologically, but this takes time, careful archaeological fieldwork, detailed stone tools analysis by experts, and not by amateurs, and prompt reports. <laughs> the genetic evidence more easily obtained can and should motivate archaeologists to enhance fieldwork and careful dating we can trace at least five major migrations before the Holocene, but probably there were more back migrations occurred and we should try and identify them as well. Thank you all.